Well, thank you, Suzanne. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, this is a fascinating subject. It's been a lot of fun actually to, to think about it. I've not actually presented on this exact topic, um, but of course my work revolves around this um, on a daily basis. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, this really brings together a lot of things. Uh, my research right now at the, at the university, I'm working on a, a PhD program. My wife, I got tired of hearing my questions. I kept asking these questions. I think, what about this? And I'm really interested in that. And she's like, nobody's going to answer your questions. You're going to have to go figure it out yourself. Go, go get a PhD. And so I went and there, there I am. I'm back in school again. I never thought it would happen. But anyway, um, so I'll touch a little bit on my research um, right now in this conversation. Uh, but really, I'm weaving together uh, in, um, elements of my research um, with um, 30 years of on the ground field experience, actually handling the material, planting plants, growing plants, collecting seed, uh, managing land, developing prescriptions for land management. Um, and also I'm weaving in what's happening right now. And I think for most of the audience today, I suspect that um, if you're watching this webinar, um, you probably are you know, aware um, or you at least believe um, the realities of climate science. Um, and, um, you know, this is, uh, it's an interesting time. Uh, and um, so anyway, let's run through some slides and, um, and see where we can get with the conversation here. Um, so I'm, I'm titling this uh, um, presentation, The Plants of the Willamette Valley and Climate Change. And it is in fact, a case study in climate associated range shifts. Um, the slide here in the background, which is kind of darkly imaged black and white thing, um, illustrates this process um, as it is unfolding. Uh, this is a little stand of trees, a little oh, copes. Of, George? Uh, yes. George, um, um, I'm not seeing, is everyone seeing um, the screen? I'm not seeing your PowerPoint. Just I'll a make moment. Sure you got that Let share. me try to share again in just a second. Okay. okay, here we go. There we go. You got, we got it. it. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, let's see. Let me do this. All right. Everybody seeing this now? Yes. Great. There we go. Okay. Uh, plants of the Willamette Valley and climate change. Uh, and again, um, so this um, little stand of trees, if you drive uh, down I-5 and you look uh, as you pass through Albany and you're traveling from Albany towards Corvallis or the Highway 34 interchange. And you look off to the left um, as you're crossing over the Saniam Canal. You might not even know that the Saniam Canal is there, but there's a little diversion off the Saniam River. Uh, and um, along that canal, um, a little stand of, of alders has popped up. And there's two species of alders in that stand. They're both red alders and white alders. And uh, they actually are a nice uh, illustration of uh, this exact, of what's going on with climate change and how climate change is affecting plant communities in the Willamette Valley. Another plant that you're likely to see as you're traveling along I-5, or at least I would say, I should say, uh, you were likely to see as you traveled along I-5 is a small tree uh, called Crataegus galicacea, um, commonly known as black hawthorn. And about 2005, 2006, um, in my travels around the Willamette Valley, I began to notice um, that black hawthorns were not looking good. Uh, and and uh, in fact, uh, you know, they were in a, a serious state of decline and over, over a large portion of the Willamette Valley. And nobody else had seemed to notice this, um, or if they did, nobody was really saying anything. And I, um, uh, I happened to uh, be in a conversation at that point in time with Alan Kanaski, who's the, or was the, uh, the state patho uh, the, patho uh, the forest pathologist for Oregon Department of Forestry. And I called Alan up one day and I said, um, hey, Alan, have you seen what's going on with black hawthorn? I, you know, it's like the tops are dying back on them. The, the crowns are turning yellow and the tops of the trees are dying. And he said, yeah, yeah, I, I've seen that. And I, and I said, well, has anybody else said anything? He said, no, nobody cares about Hawthorne. <laughs> and it's kind of true. 
Um, but you know, if you drive along the highways, though, and uh, this started particularly in Marion County, but now it's it's pretty much happening in every county in, in the Willamette Valley. Um, and now it's you can see it along um, any of the highways, any of the highways in the Willamette Valley. You'll see this happening anywhere else. Anywhere you see uh, black hawthorn at this point, you're going to see them um, falling into a state of disrepair. Um, I asked Alan if he'd be willing to look at some samples, and I made some samples and I sent them down to him and. Um, he looked uh, at the material and he said, you know, I can't find anything here. There's no clear pathogen at work here. Um, he did some cultural cu culture work and some um, uh, microscopy on them. And there was just nothing really there. He said, I, I don't, I don't know. So I just, you know, I kind of let it go. And I figured, well, there's some kind of new pathogen that's been, been released here. Somehow we've introduced, which of course is a, if you see a, a native tree dying or in, in, disrepair, the chances that it's being hit by some non-native pathogen are actually quite high. We've introduced a lot of them. Anyway, he couldn't see anything like that, and I just sort of let it go, and I had other, lot other things to worry about. When I went back to the university, um, I was traveling that part of the Willamette Valley on a regular basis, and it had become so extreme that literally thousands of thousands upon thousands of trees as you're driving through that part of the valley, you could just see them along the highways and the byways just melting into the into the into the ground and being overtaken by um, blackberries. And, and what you'll see is this kind of decline, um, kind of it, it's, a, it's a standard tree decline. You'll see chlorosis, you'll see branch flagging, you'll see leaf drop premature leaf drop, you'll see short shoots and reduced leaves and reduced buds. And then ultimately you see entire parts of the crown die. And then gradually the, the upper crown just sort of melts away. And then sometimes you'll see kind of this vigorous root, root growth or, or um, water shoots coming up from the base of the tree. But then those begin to experience the same crown symptoms. They'll begin to become chlorotic and the leaves will become small. And then eventually those, those vigorous uh, shoots also die. The whole thing just melts and gets engulfed by um, blackberry and um, various other weedy uh, rosaceous things like um, uh, prunus avium bird cherry. So basically we're losing this whole element of the, of the flora and it's like well why is this happening? And so I was working uh, you know as I was at the university um, every week I, I st started talking with the pathologist there and, and she also had not seen or heard anything about this black hawthorn. I brought her a bunch of samples and sample after sample, there's just nothing there. It's an, you know, and ultimately she says, this is an environmental decline. I'm like, really? How surprising is that? You know, if you think about black hawthorn, if you know this tree, you would have probably thought like I did that this is a cockroach, it's not a canary, but it turns out that that's just wrong. You know, this is uh, as tough and, and durable as this tree is. It's just simply not equipped to deal with what's happening now. Um, and uh, so this uh, this is actually some graphics out of a little preprint that I just uh, I just sent out a couple of months ago, and I'm gonna I'm submitting it for publication soon. Um, I had never intended to spend any time in, with climate data, um, but once I kind of fell down this hole, I couldn't get out. So um, I've spent an awful lot of time pouring over tremendous amounts of climate data. And anyone who has any question about climate change, I would just encourage you to look at the data. Don't listen to anybody else. Just look at the data in a critical way. And what's happening here just becomes so profoundly clear. So um, without going into a whole lot of detail, uh, basically, uh, the panels on the left basically show temperature trends in three uh, Willamette Valley stations. And I chose Willamette Valley stations that were uh, particularly isolated from urban island heat effects so that we can kind of discount that as a, as a, as a factor, an error in the data. Um, and uh, so if you look at these uh, relatively urban isolated uh, rural stations, we see this very strong upward trend in temperature. Uh, and uh, specifically here, I'm looking at summertime temperatures. So uh, for those of you who've worked with plants in the Willamette Valley, you know that when thing, that things die in August, right? They die in August because it's hot and it's dry 
And we've now been, we're hitting our 40 or 40th or 50th day without any precipitation at all. And we hit those 90 or even 100 degree days and stuff just dies, right? So this is a pinch point for vegetation in the Willamette Valley. It's one of the things that makes Willamette Valley vegetation what it is. Um, you know, and, and it, you know, the Willamette Valley has, you know, for, for many hundreds or even thousands of years has had the summer drought, summer heat um, kind of uh, climate. It's a, it's a marginally Mediterranean climate, right? What we're seeing is sort of an, a, uh, an intensification of that, um, of that climate uh, uh, attribute, those climate attributes of, of summer drought, summer heat. So it's hotter and drier. And as a result, we are, we're getting these really serious spikes in, in vapor, uh, de vapor deficit. And vapor deficit really combines temperature and, uh, and humidity uh, and uh, soil moisture into a graphic that basically shows you or gives you a sense of what environmental conditions plants are having to endure. And so basically what these, these graphs are showing us is that it's getting tougher and tougher to be a plant in the Willamette Valley, depending on what you are, right? That's one of the interesting things about the Willamette Valley. We have really uh, elements of both northerly um, kind of cool maritime system, flora, floristic elements here. And we also have um, a significant number of more Mediterranean adapted species. And so there's an opportunity and, and really what this little preprint that I've, I've put out um, does, and I'll, I'll give you the, um, the web address for that. And if, if anybody's interested, I'd be happy to email people a link to, to that. Um, so you can look at the publication or the pre-publication. Um, really, um, so the opportunity here is we can look at these differentially, um, uh, these, these plants with differential ranges and we can see how they're responding uh, within a cl climatically, um, uh, with a warm, within a warming, but climatically more or less homogenous area. Um, so, you know, you go out on a hot August day in the Northern Willamette Valley. And if you look uh, in, in uh, forest stands in Washington County uh, or uh, lower elevations in Clackamas County, you're gonna, you'll often see something like this panel on the left here. And this is a Western red cedar here that's, that's flagging out and dying. This is now a dead tree. Um, I, there are several stands of um, uh, salmonberry um, that I know of in the Willamette Valley and that I've actually used for seed collection areas. And I basically just watched them melt away. <laughs> um, you know, you go out on a hot, hot August day and, you, and this might be what you see. Uh, there were stands along the lower Malala River, for instance. Uh, this was a stand um, uh, on a little uh, stream in Washington County, uh, just dead, dead as a doornail. Other places, mixed stands, here's Grand Fur. Um, and you know, one of the things that's striking about this uh, image to me, uh, this is a, a, a picture I took in, in um, Western Washington County. Um, the thing that's striking here is that we have two different species of trees one is doing terribly and another is doing just fine. Well, that to me is interesting. You know, what's going on with that? Why is this? In fact, we can look at a number of, of trees in the Willamette Valley, and these are all images that I've taken um, over the last couple of years. Big leaf maple, looks great. Gary oak, they look fine. There are, you know, uh, it's rare to see major tree health issues in either of those two species. Same thing with um, Oregon ash, um, white alder. These are all relatively common Willamette Valley trees and they're all doing just fine, right? It's one of the reasons why people can look out across the landscape and see a lot of green and say, what's the problem? <laughs> There's not a problem. Well, it really depends on which species you look at. So on the other hand, we can look at Abies grandis, the grand fir here in this stand mixed with Douglas fir, but the grand fir, they're easy to pick out because they're all dead. Um, Western red cedar uh, growing here in a mixed stand with big leaf maple. Uh, e again, easy to distinguish because the Western red cedar, of course they don't look like uh, maples, but they're also dead. <laughs> um, and uh, red alder. Um, as a counterpoint to what's going on with white alder. You know, typically red alder stands in, in, on the valley floor. They look terrible. 
And again, here's my, my old friend, um, Black Hawthorne. So when you put this stuff on a graph, when you actually go out and collect data, which I did, um, I collected a lot of stand data um, as I got dragged down into this ugly pit of, of, of climate. And I'm like, oh, I've got to actually get the data. And so I did. And when you look at it, it's pretty striking, right? So if you put these two, if you put our trees, our Willamette Valley trees into bins, and you say, well, it's a more, it's a Mediterranean species. It's, it's like ash. It's like um, uh, Gary Oak. Uh, you put them in the Mediterranean species bin, the Mediterranean species look pretty darn good. Tree health is good, right? The vast majority of the trees of all of these Mediterranean adaptive species are looking just fine. These other species, which I call temperate maritime species, are not looking so good. <laughs> In fact, they look terrible. This is this this is not a graph of a tree that you want to be, right? Um, because this is a this is what a, a a species that's on its way out. This is what stand statistics of a species that's in serious decline looks like. Serious, serious decline. Um, actually, I want to skip down here briefly. Um, I got this slide out of order. Um, so I want to talk about well, why is this, right? So the thing that got me really going on this, and um, so I already knew because I was already knee deep in alders, that's the focus of my dissertation. Um, I was already knee deep into those and I'm like, wow, red alder looks terrible. It's doing horribly in the Willamette Valley. Um, and yet white alder looks just fine. And I already knew something about the ranges of these two species. I knew that we were kind of marginal. We're at the Southern cusp, uh, Southern and interior cusp of the range of red alder. Here we are in the Willamette Valley, right? And as opposed to Ulnus rhombifolia, we're really a northerly extension of the range of Ulnus rhombifolia. So I've kind of already had a sense of the ranges of these two trees. And then that's what got me thinking, well, wow, I'm seeing these dying black hawthorns. I wonder what their range looks like. And then what about grand fir? What does the range of grand fir look like? And, and, and while I'm at it, why don't I look at the range of, of Western red cedar? And the striking thing that emerges when you stop and you look at the range data. And so this is just some, these are just data points. This is uh, um, known localities of, based on herbarium records for all of these species projected. Um, I'm a GIS hack, so pardon my terrible maps here, but um, just projected onto a map. Um, but it's something really striking appears here. So if you look at these northerly, this what I call these Pacific maritime species, they have these commonalities. Um, you know, most of them extend their northerly extensions are you know in southeastern Alaska or or um, or western British Columbia along the coast, and then through western Washington and Oregon. Uh, and then also they tend to have um, these outlying uh, uh, populations, disjunctions as they call them. In the, inland, in the Inland Empire, uh, which is no, Northern Idaho and Western Montana. Uh, but you know, then down through Washington, and then as you approach California, their ranges contract right down to this narrow band along the coast with the fog belt, right? So they're, they all, all have distribution. And I'm seeing that I'm having some connectivity issues. So, Suzanne or Kristen, let me know if, if I start to fade out here. Um, so, George, it was just so a far, moment so where you froze, but um, it's been okay so far. So hopefully it'll continue to be okay. Yeah, Yeah. just let me know. And if, if there's any problem, I'll relocate. Um, so really it's this distribution in California that's really telling for these these species. You can see these kind of dis, these narrowings of the ranges down here. You know, we can contrast that with these more what I call Mediterranean species, uh, which uh, all of which the bulk of their range is to our south. That's even true with, with big leaf maple, which does extend up into Western Washington fairly significantly. Um, but with these other species, you know, you can really see that the bulk of these populations, oops, just happened there, is to our south. 
this is really, really important. And it's germane to the topic today, which is why I wanted to point it out. Uh, and I'll point you to some resources um, at the end of the, of the talk of, that, it, that I would encourage you if you're interested in these sorts of things, this kind of analysis um, as you're thinking about land management and you're thinking about plant communities and you're thinking about trying to develop plant communities for the future, um, I would suggest to you that these are very important considerations and there's some nice tools that are easily accessible that we can all use to do this kind of analysis. Uh, I'm gonna skip back up here, pardon my skipping around. Um, and uh, again, just int briefly introduce my, um, my dissertation subjects, or at least some of them, um, red alder and white alder. And again, this, this real contrast, um, they're two nice species, at least taxonomically, they're nice species. Uh, they're, they're readily distinguished on morphological features. Um, and I won't go into the detail of that, but if anybody's interested in alder, I'm always happy to talk <laughs> ad nauseum. So don't get me started. <laughs> um, uh, again, contrasting with white alder. And uh, for those of you who are familiar with white alder, um, you know, this is the white, this is our alder of the future in the Willamette Valley. Uh, I hate to say that uh, because I love all these trees, you know, and, and I, I hate to say goodbye. Uh, but uh, you know, in, in a sense, that's somewhat our reality. Um, and um, I, we just have to be realistic about it. And, and I say that too, when I've, I've got, I don't know, 20,000 of them growing out there in the nursery right now, the red alders, <laughs> it's like <laughs> not being a very good salesman <laughs> right now, but I like to be real with people, right? And that's, that's what this conversation is about. Again, here's white alder. Again, beautiful taxonomic species, readily distinguished based on morphological characteristics. And ecologically, um, such an interesting contrast with red alder, even though they grow together commonly in the Willamette Valley. There are very, very different things happening with these two species. Um, so one aspect of my research includes a, a pretty substantial co uh, reciprocal common garden uh, trial. I have four, four garden sites that, are, that span um, a range from the floor of the Willamette Valley to the crest of the Coast Range. And um, so I'm, since we're talking today about the Willamette Valley, I'm really focused on the, on the valley floor gardens and what's happening between these two species um, in these common gardens. And the very, very clear pattern, differential pattern of mortality um, so the slides that I've shown you before, of course, were, were uh, pictures of, of existing natural stands. Um, but when we go to actually plant these things out uh, in a plantation setting, um, this is what happens. So red alder um, survival um, is much lower. Initial survival is much lower uh, in these common garden trials uh, than white alder. White alder is significantly uh, more likely to survive um, initial, uh, uh, those initial two years. And, um, and of course, this is critically important. You know, we cannot overemphasize the importance of early plant survival. You know, you can't get anywhere as a tree if you can't survive the first couple of years, right? Very, very important stuff. Um, and I can't pass up the opportunity to talk a little bit about hybridization. Um, this is also important. Um, you know, this is happening in my study organisms, but it's happening in lots of other organisms um, in all kinds of ways. Uh, and hybridization is a process that's that's garnered a lot of attention over the centuries by science, um, and it continues. You know, the intricacies of these processes can continue to elude us. It's very complicated how these different populations interact, but um, population interaction is all about hybridization. And so, as I mentioned, uh, you know, we have these two beautiful taxonomic species and you could see how really different these leaves are. There's lots of nice uh, characters in the leaves that we can use to distinguish these two species, but hybrids do occur and they are intermediate. Um, and this is of real interest to me. And it's important too, again, um, to this topic, because um, as Suzanne and Kristen and I were discussing before uh, we started the session, there's more to this conversation than just climate. There are all kinds of other factors that influence plant communities. 
climate is just one of them. We have um, other environmental factors like day length, for instance, um, that are not affected by climate change. So very short days or very short winter days um, have an effect on plants. Very long summer days have an effect on plants that is independent of climate. There are soils effects too um, that are independent of climate. And so if we're looking at uh, three, it's, pardon me, <laughs> in this photograph, two species of alders, both of which are currently adapted, or let's say 50 years ago, they were both adapted to conditions in the Willamette Valley. They were adapted to our climate, but they were also adapted to day length, they were adapted to soils, they were adapted to other environmental factors. If we lose one of those species, we've lost all of its adaptedness in this locality that was not related to climate. If we wish to somehow transfer that adaptiveness to this um, migrating, northerly migrating species, hybrids are the only way to make that happen. So hybridization is a very, very important process. And I think it's something that we're gonna have to be thinking about as we move forward. Um, I have to throw in that we do have a third um, species of alder in the Willamette Valley, it's Ulnus and Cana, it's very rare. And in fact, the three populations that are known were not known before I started this study. Um, I, I've knew, known that they were here and they were historically known to be present in the Willamette Valley, but they hadn't been collected in the Willamette Valley since the early 1900s, but they're still here. I will not talk much about them um, right now. I'd love to, but I, in the interest of time, we're gonna move on. Uh, yes. George, does the Alnus and Cana have a common name that we would recognize? Uh, well, it has a couple. Thin leaf alder is probably the most accurate one. Um, it also is called mountain alder. Um, and interestingly, in some places, uh, and this is a circumboreal species, by the way, which is interesting as well. Uh, so it occurs throughout Eurasia and across North America, all the way across North America. It's also in other parts of the world called swamp alder, huh? which is great. And very important for us too, but I won't go into that. If somebody wants to talk to, with me about alders and beaver swamp, I would be happy to discuss it at a, at a future time. Um, I will mention here, however, that all three of these species are involved in a three-way hybrid zone in the Willamette Valley, unbeknownst to most of us. So if I can shed some light on that for myself and for anyone else that's interested, I'm, I'm excited to do that. So now let's talk about sure. the topic of the day. One. Yeah, and one, and you can answer this now or later. There is one question related to hybrids. Um, if we know anything about survivorship of hybrid species, um, so your choice. We want to address that now or later. Excellent, excellent question, and actually one that I'm addressing in my common gardens because I have um, both reds, whites, and hybrids between the two. And interestingly, uh, as is true with morphological features and some other um, ecological. Um, um, data, they're intermediate in survival, actually, between reds and whites, which is exactly, if one were to make a hypothesis, that was, was is the likely test hypothesis, right? So uh, they are, um, uh, they seem to be, be somewhat intermediate, which is what you would expect, right? So they have some of the adaptiveness, the current adaptive, adaptiveness of white alder, um, but also some of the current maladaptiveness of red alder. It's an excellent question. Um, so I thought I would just um, talk briefly, you know, um, about what we might expect. And um, one of the things that, you know, came out of, you know, my kind of digging through the data, if you look at the last six years in the Willamette Valley, um, you know, you, you might have heard in the past that um, climate experts the world over have said that, you know, we want to limit climate change to a degree and a half um, Celsius change, of, you know, we, uh, to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. Well, if you look at Willamette Valley climate data over the last six years, we're over a degree and a half Celsius above the, um, the mid-1900s. That's significant. The temperature in the Willamette Valley is now hotter 
than it used to be in Roseburg. And if anybody knows the, uh, the, the middle Umpqua Valley, you know that the plant communities of the, of the Umpqua Valley are very different from the plant communities of the Willamette Valley. I mean, certainly there's some overlap. There's a lot of commonalities too, but there's a number of things that are missing. Uh, Western red cedar is missing. Grand fir is missing. Over large areas, Douglas fir is missing. Red alder is completely absent. White alder, on the other hand, is quite common. Anyway, if you keep going south and you look into Northern California, you can find areas in Northern California that have very comparable precipitation, pre precipitation regimes to the Willamette Valley. And so, you know, one of my favorite areas in, in that part of the world is around Ukiah. And fascinating stuff down there, really, really interesting territory. Um, and, um, you know, a completely different flora. Um, you, you can't find Gary Oak. If you look hard enough, you can find some Gary Oaks in Mendocino County and, and other parts of Northern California. Um, but you also see a whole slew of other oak species like this Quercus wislizani, Wislands Oaks, Wislands Oaks. I don't know what, if it's got another common name. Um, you'll also see uh, Pinus sabiniana, oh, which is called the gray pine, great big humongous cones. Um, and you know, you think about it. You know, here's a place that gets about the same rainfall as um, the Willamette Valley. It's just about three and a half, four degrees hotter Celsius. What a change that can make! It's just, it's a whole nother world. I'm going to skip down through a few things. Uh, we don't need to talk about that. Uh, just to say that I do have these reciprocal common garden trials. Um, so um, I think that this next little part of the of the talk, I'd like to talk about the process of growing uh, plants. And I um, had fortunately a little bit of time and an opportunity. There was a great cone crop on Douglas fir um, this year. So my daughter and I went out and um, and did some climbing. Actually, my son did some climbing too. And I just wanted to show a picture that I can still climb trees. I like to climb trees. <laughs> Makes me feel alive. <laughs> so I got up, you know, into a couple of these trees, 150, 160 feet up. Um, lots of fun. Um, but, you know, this is how it happens, right? So we're collecting seed uh, to grow out. And this is quite a process. You know, in some cases, we're climbing trees. In some cases, we're actually picking cones. In some cases, we're shaking seed or cones out of the trees or picking them out of shrubs on the ground. Um, and, uh, you know, and then we're taking that, uh, that seed material or fruits, those fruits and different kinds of seed materials. This is actually a bin full of alder cones. And then we're processing seed out of those, right? And we're doing all of this in natural stands, right? So we're identifying natural stands um, that are occupying habitats or, or regions uh, in uh, the Willamette Valley that, that we're, we're growing for specifically. We're collecting that seed and we're processing it. And, and uh, we extract the seed, we purify the seed using a variety of different methods. And then we try to keep track of this. We've got 100, right now we've got 100 and I think about 180 species of, of native seed in supply right now. About 150 of those we're currently growing um, as uh, bare root stock of, um, of many types, um, including bulbs and rhizomes of herbaceous things. Um, and just tracking all this stuff. So there's a tremendous database really of information that we have here related to seed collection, seed processing, seed storage, um, and seed propagation. Just a tremendous amount of information. Um, one of the things that uh, Kristen and I and Suzanne and I were talking about as well before the session started was the fact that, uh, and I hadn't thought about this until I started putting this presentation together, that this migration of plants that we're talking about, whether we assist it or not, um, there's a corresponding migration of knowledge that needs to happen as well. And I hadn't really considered this. Um, because like I told Susanna Kristen, I don't want to move to King County. <laughs> no interest in living in King County. I'm perfectly happy where I am. I don't want to move. Um, and, and yet there's things that I know and there's elements of our flora that 
are likely to be of real interest to people in King County that they don't even know about yet. And how do we transfer that information? How do we transfer that knowledge to folks to our north? If they are in fact going to be recipients of parts of our flora, how do we inform them of parts of our flora? Tell them about things that they, they really need to know. Uh, and then of course there's the propagation side, right? So, you know, we're, we're taking all the seed material and we're growing it out here at the farm. And right now we're producing um, uh, somewhere around 200 uh, or uh, two and a half million to 3 million plants a year amongst all the different stock types, um, including bare root trees and shrubs and herbaceous things, bulbs and so on and so forth. You know, and one of the questions of course is, well, okay, these are the things that we're growing now. These are the things that people know here now. This is what you know, folks at the Lucky Mute Watershed in the Lucky Mute Watershed, for instance, are planting in their in their projects. These are the species that are parts of the flora that they know. And you know, it's interesting. Uh, you know, even some of these elements that we have in the Willamette Valley. You know, so think about white alder, and I've been been talking about white alder for years now, and encouraging people to consider it. But I can't tell you how many times I've suggested it to people. It's like, well, you know. Have you considered, because they would describe a site to me that they want to plant, then I'd say, well, you might think about white alder instead of red alder for that site. And, and people would say, well, I don't see any white alders around here. I, I, I don't know that. I've never seen it before. I, well, why would I plant that? And it's such an interesting thing. Um, you know, one of the things, too, that, um, that I should point out um, is that, uh, you know, part of my exploration of, the, of these things has included really understanding their current ranges. And, uh, you know, so we, you know, through our study have expanded the range of known current range of Ulnus and Cana, for instance, the, the thin leaf alder, but also I've substantially expanded the, the known range of um, white alder. So we now have localities, I've got locality data in herbarium specimens now from Columbia County uh, which was well north of the known range in, in Oregon. Um, I've got um, a locality in Kalama that I didn't discover, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> I'm a little irritated about the Jacob beat me to that one. Good for him. <laughs> I did visit it, and it's a great stand. I'm using it in my study. Um, but in, now, at this at this point in the Willamette Valley, I've got localities in Yamho County, um, uh, Polk County, um, Benton County. There, there I've got. Um, White alders recorded in every county in, in, in the Willamette Valley, including Washington County. Finally, I found a stand in Washington County and I, for years I've been looking for it. And for years I've been driving by the same tree and never noticed it. <laughs> it's great. Um, um, it's actually right on Scoggins Creek for anybody that knows uh, Washington County. If you're traveling north on Highway 47 and as you cross over Scoggins Creek, I'm thinking, because I had just collected a bunch of white alder in Yamhill County and, and I'm like, okay, so how is this any different than the upper Tualatin? How is this any different from Scoggins Creek? Why am I not finding white alder on Scoggins Creek? As I'm thinking this exact thing and driving over Scoggins Creek, I look to my right and there it was. So anyway, Washington County is now on the white alder map. Um, I hope that this works. Can folks see this? I'm gonna to try to play this. I wanna bring up a whole nother issue here. Can, can everybody see this slide? Okay, I'm gonna to try to play a little video here. We'll see how it works. Does it have any audio, George, or is it just visual? Can it? Can you not hear that? Uh uh. No. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, no problem. I think there's another um, setting that you can you share audio um, on the top. If it's the same as mine, I think one of the options is to share audio as well as video, but um, I'm not sure where that might be on your view. Here, ah, here we go. I'm sorry. I'm gonna actually start it over because I love. Oh, it. there we go. I hear it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna go back just a little bit.
love this video. I wish um, there's so much here. In the background, this is a little tiny natural area, a little remnant natural area in right in the middle of Tigard, Oregon, right in, West, in, in Eastern Washington County. This is a bucket full of um, Camassia-like linea, like lens camas that I had just collected. And I was so busy collecting and collecting and collecting and throwing the seed into, the, into a bucket. And then I, I didn't even notice until the end. I'm like, I look in there and the whole thing is just crawling with bugs. <laughs> just everything in there. There's spiders and leafhoppers and thrips and little um, inchworms and just all kinds of things. And again, of course, I'm not an entomologist. You see the ladybug in here. Unbelievable invertebrate diversity in this bucket of seed. And anyone who's collected seed can probably appreciate this, uh, unless you happen to be my wife. Um, because I would sometimes bring these things into the house. I remember I had brought a bu bunch of bags of white oak into the house because the squirrels were eating it <laughs> outside. I just couldn't keep the squirrels out of it, so I just brought it in the house. And the next thing you know, there's all these little castings and, and little cocoons all over the living room ceiling. <laughs> anyway, uh, the point being um, that it's not just plants, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, one of the things when, when I talk with people about biodiversity, you know, and we think about lists of species and so on and so forth. And what we miss in those conversations is the fact that biodiversity is really all about connections. It's about the interactions between organisms. That's what makes it interesting. You know, and the fact that, you know, when you think about, um, you know, free living organisms like plants and the fact that free living and, and humans actually too, uh, that we're vastly outnumbered by parasites, um, things that feed on uh, things that live inside of us and other organisms, you know, all of these things, um, and, and not, not to mention things like pollinators as well. And, and, uh, um, just, there is so much going on, you know, in these interactions. And so if you've ever collected seed, so for instance, in things like nine bark, if you collect a bucket full of nine bark seed, you're going to have probably about 60% of that bucket is going to be, uh, insect biomass unbelievable volumes of insects use these plants and also you know by extension feed the birds if you're interested in birds that's how this stuff works so when we talk about transferring plants we've got to remember the reason we're doing that at least in part is to support habitats to support food webs how do we do that I mean, I suppose we could carry buckets of insects around. <laughs> um, the thing is that plants turn out to be much more facile um, when it comes to moving things. Uh, it's easier to move plants than it is to move animals, even insects. How do you do that? How do you go about moving insects? You don't know, you know, while they may be sitting in this bucket because they, they came off of a camas plant, they might have just happened to be sitting on that camas plant, or they might have been feeding on that camas plant, or any number of other interactions they might have had with it. Uh, they could be there for any number of reasons. But um, if I say, well, I'll just take this inchworm and I'll move it with this camas seed and I'll take it up to Western Washington where it's now climate adapted, what are the chances that that inchworm is actually going to survive? Yeah. Nobody knows. I'd say they're probably pretty darn slim because we won't have at the same time been able to transport all of the other elements of the of its habitat, all of its other requirements with it. This is important stuff. Oops, there we go. Okay, so moving on. So what do we do with this? Um, so here's a, um, um, a lovely Pinus sabiniana cone. Um, and so I guess now we're really getting to the, the, the heart of the matter here. Um, I, what did what I say the, the title of this, <laughs> this talk is? Who's calling the shots? <laughs> well, indeed, who is calling the shots? <clears throat> and I guess <clears throat> one of the things I should point out if folks don't already realize this, <clears throat> that um, it is absolutely legal within the, within the United States of America, within the contiguous United States, to move essentially any native plant anywhere you want, anywhere. There are very, very, very few limitations on that, basically free for all. There are no limitations. So who's calling the shots? 
whoever wants to call the shots, <laughs> anybody, we can all call the shots. Uh, there are no limitations. There is no design. There is no directive. There is no central agency that is saying what we should do or what we shouldn't do or can or can't do. There's a lot of hand wringing. Yes, lots of that. Um, but there's no real coordinated anything. So just to get that out of the way. Uh, and then by you know taking it one step further, if you look at this on a global scale, when we talk about assisted migration, and this is where it's kind of amusing actually, some of the hand wringing that goes on about assisted migration. I'm like, what planet have you people been living on? Uh, because we are all about assisted migration and we have been ever since we learned how to build boats. And even before that, just traveling across land, people were been moving plants around just like many, many, many other animal species. The only thing difference is that we're actually doing it intentionally and carrying things with our hands, as well as tracking them around on our clothes and our fur, like other animals. Um, anyway, so that's the legal side of assisted migration. It's the wild, wild west, and anybody can move anything anywhere that they want. In fact, you can go online right now and you can buy giant hogweed seeds on the net <laughs> and have them delivered to your doorstep. And you could plant them right there in the Lucky Mute watershed count, uh, the Lucky Mute watershed if you won't, were so inclined. I Please don't. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. It's true. There is essentially, you know, we, we talk about this stuff as if anybody's got control, but this is a, again, a, a really serious if, issue. Um, and a real threat to um, the future of what's left of our native plant communities. But anyway, I wanted to mention that uh, if you want to move something around, you can do it. Should you do it? That's another question. So there are some, you know, for all of the controversy and hand wringing and worrying and, and, and people, you know, arguing about this whole thing while it's happening anyway, um, there are a number of things that should be relatively non-controversial. And so I wanted to, to talk about those first. So if we want to assist migration, why not assist the things that are already here, right? So as a, for instance, the California black oak, um, Quercus kelloggii, um, pictured here growing, um, in our nursery, um, it's this is the largest grow out of um, Quercus kelloggii uh, in the in the history of the planet, as as far as I'm aware. Um, I think over the last two years we've grown about twenty five thousand of these, and that's really hard because it's not easy collecting the acorns uh, of this species. Their uh, mass production is very spotty, and um, you got to travel and you got to work hard to collect them and got to beat the squirrels to them. Um, it's not. They're not nearly as common in the Willamette Valley as, the, as Gary Oak, but they are here. They're well established through the middle part of Lane County. Um, and um, they, um, uh, they're almost to Benton County. And one of my objectives, um, one of my life, um, uh, one of my bucket list items is to find Gary Oak or pardon me, uh, Kellogg Oak um, in Benton County, but I haven't been able to do it yet. Anyway, here it is. So it's already here in the Willamette Valley. So certainly for the southern half of the Willamette Valley, and I, at this point, I'd say anywhere in the Willamette Valley, this is a tree you might want to consider. It's a fantastic tree. It's a great wildlife tree. It's a long-lived um, oak in the red oak half of the oak family um, and supports tremendous amounts of wildlife. It's been considered uh, one of the most, if not the most valuable wildlife tree in the state of California. This is something we should welcome with open arms. And it's already here. So what's to argue? Yes. George, Suzanne. I have a question um, about the, so if, if assisted migration is the, you know, what, what folks are talking about, you know, planting trees on purpose that are typically in a more southern range, in a northern range and helping that along, it, it's already happening naturally what would you say would be the, uh, well, I'm not sure which side of the issue you fall on, but I'm gonna guess you fall on the issue of bringing those plants in and having it happen faster than in a natural way. And can you talk about whether that is going to, in your opinion, is gonna have an impact on wildlife that doesn't adapt as quickly as uh, perhaps 
it would have had it happen naturally. You mean in a negative way affect yeah. wildlife? In, in a neg like say red alder versus white alder um, insects or wildlife that are adapted to a red alder environment say that wouldn't be necessarily adapted to an environment with white alder. Well, in the case of fortunately, in the well, not fortunately, but in the case of the alders, um, if you don't plant white alder at this point in the Willamette Valley, it's very likely that you won't have any alder at all. Mm. Um, so if you want to have alder on your site, if you want to have the genus Ulnus on your site, uh, and you opt to plant only red alder because that's all you can see in your neighborhood, the chances are in 20 years, they're all going to be dead. Mm. Um, and one of the things I didn't point out, but my research is pretty clear, the numbers are pretty clear, the, the rates of mortality of those northerly species right now are ranging between 5 and 7% annually. What that looks like when you graph it out uh, in, say, grand fur, as a for instance, the, the number of grand fur that were present in the Willamette Valley in 2014, by 2025, 50% of those trees will be dead. It's, I mean, this stuff is happening fast. It's happening fast. Red alder is probably even worse uh, in terms of its current rates of mortality. So it's on its way out. So if you want alder, if, if you're really particular and you want alder on your site, you better be thinking about planting some white alders if you're on the valley floor. Absolutely. Um, so as far as, you know, um, wildlife effects, you know, I don't want to say um, that I'm an advocate uh, I'm a realist. Um, I don't like the fact that I'm having to, I, I, I'll take that back. It's, it's a wonderful opportunity. I'm going to take the positive spin here. It's a wonderful opportunity to learn things about the, the flora of Northern California that I probably never would have even looked at. I wouldn't have considered it. And so it's kind of exciting actually to be able to look at those other floristic elements and think, well, wow, what can we do with this? What makes sense here? Um, and, you know, so there's really two, there's two general modes of assisted migration that are considered. And um, the ones that I'm talking about now are these marginal assists, basically. There, I think there's a term that somebody's dreamed up for this one. I can't remember what it is, but basically assisting migration, northerly migration at the margins of the range, ranges of these species. And that would be the case in Quercus kelloggiae. So if it's already well established in Lane County, planting this species in Lynn County or Polk County or, or Bent County is just essentially extending its range. One of the wonderful things about that, well, that at least we can hope for anyway, is that because it, it's planted essentially right next door to, to, to existing stands, the chance for associated species to migrate into those new stands is quite good, right? So it's one thing to take Quercus kelloggii and plant it in Benton County when the next stand to the south is only five miles away, yeah. right? Birds can fly, insects can fly, things find this stuff, right? Um, you know, that is a process, you know, that process of particularly of invertebrate migration is something we know nothing about. But the chances of, of, of successful migration over a span of a couple of miles are much, much better than if we were to take this species and say, well, we think this species is going to be adapted in, in Snohomish County in 50 years. So we're gonna plant it there now. What's the chances that any of the associated species are gonna make it that far? Pretty darn slim. So these are the things that, that right now, I think should be pretty non-controversial. Um, and I think that they make sense. Um, does George, that... we've got a, oh, sorry. Go ahead. A question. Okay. Um, one question. Does California black oak occupy the same savanna or woodland type system as Oregon white oak? That's a good question. Um, and I can't say as I'm a, a, a really an expert in uh, California black oak, but the, my understanding and my general impression of these stands is ex yes, exactly. So there's some really beautiful stands. Um, if you go down around Lorraine, um, if you, there's a park there um, on the banks of the um, uh, Fernhill Reservoir. I, I cannot, can't remember the name of it. Uh, Territorial Park. Beautiful uh, trees, some open grown, beautiful open grown uh, California black oaks there. 
very much a savanna tree. It can be a stand former, um, just like Gary Oak can be. Uh, it can be a tall forest tree, just like Gary Oak can be, but it can also be a broad, open crowned, open grown savanna specimen. But yeah, great question. Um, here's another plant, um, you know, and so part of this, you know, just like with the, with the white alder um, question that I get, well, why would I plant that? I've, I don't ever see that around here. Well, because you didn't look carefully enough. Um, you know, these things are, are, are the ranges of these plants, there's more going on in our flora than we, than most of us know. Uh, so here's a, a nice example of that, of this. This is Bacchus pilularis, um, otherwise known as uh, coyote brush. Um, this is a shrubby plant in the sunflower family. Um, and uh, it's common in Northern California, in the coast ranges of Northern California and along the coast. Uh, and, it, and it works its way northward along the coast and you'll find it on the beaches all the way up to Clatsop County at this point. And probably north of there, if you look carefully enough. Uh, I have a number of localities for this plant in Tillamook County. Um, but it also is in the coast range of Oregon, as it turns out. Uh, and it pops up on clear cut uh, on uh, logging landings uh, in the coast range uh, and other kind of disturbed sites um, and other places too. It's at Bald Hill uh, County Park in Benton County, for instance. Um, and so it's, a, it's an element of the um, uh, Willamette Valley uh, foothills. And in fact, um, right here, this is a planted stand of it I've got here at the farm. But right up here, I don't know if people could see my pointer, um, but right up here on Gales Peak, um, right up above the farm, I found this plant growing. It's a county record for Washington County of Bacchus pilularis. There it was growing on a logging landing. So here's a, here's a species, again, um, that might be considered, um, this might be considered a, an assisted migration. Uh, but in fact, um, the species is already here. And we might in some cases be surprised um, at how far north these things already range. Um, there's a lot we still don't know about plant ranges, and it's just because we haven't put enough eyes on the ground to see all this stuff. Um, again, um, white alder. Um, this is not an assisted migration, but it is a consideration, right? So it's a consideration that uh, here's a species, its range is predominantly to our south. It appears to be well adapted in the Willamette Valley. And for that matter, it's still well adapted in the valleys of Northern California. So the chances that this thing's gonna hang on here for us are pretty decent. Another tree what are, that, the, what are the common names of these again? Uh, this is white alder here oh, on yes. the left. Oh, I, I was is, covered up, okay, yeah. I, yeah, well, I just, do I have the common names up there? I don't know if I do. No. Um, I think I've just got scientific names here. I'm sorry. Um, white alder uh, here on the left <laughs> and incense cedar on the right. And a lot of people don't think about incense cedar in the Willamette Valley, but it's absolutely here. Mm -hmm. uh, it's well established in all of Lane County. Um, it's natural in Lynn County. Um, it is possibly natural, but certainly naturalized throughout Benton County and points north all the way up to British Columbia. So this is a widely used ornamental tree um, that's naturalizing just fine all over the place west of the Cascades. Uh, and again, natural um, all the way up to Marion County. So there are stands of this species um, along the Sanium River in Marion County. You have to look to find them, but they're there. So we can talk about assisted migration. You know, I mean, is this still assisted migration? If you're planting it in, in Marion County, what if you're planting it in Washington County? Well, you could call it assisted migration, but somebody already did that. <laughs> somebody did it a long time ago. This is, you know, the pie, this was actually a, a, a favorite tree um, on a lot of pioneer homesteads um, for whatever reason. I don't know why exactly, but you'll see it. And there's old plantings of this thing throughout the Willamette Valley. So that's already a done deal. I think we can all move on. <laughs> that would be my suggestion. George, I just want yeah. to um, stop a moment and just uh, remind everyone that uh, we have about uh, 20, a little more than 20 minutes left to the presentation. And we do have a couple uh, questions and, um, you know, waiting for a good time to, to ask. And uh, so I want to invite all of our participants, uh, if you have a burning question, um, and George, is this a good time to ask away? Sure. Absolutely. Right. 
Yeah, at any point, happy to answer questions. Perfect. Okay, there's a, a couple here. Um, so any chance a migrant might become invasive? Always, sure, yes. Um, you know, thinking about something like Bacchus is a you know very fast growing uh, shrub. Um, to be honest, if it's native in the Western United States, probably not. Um, you know, um, I've not seen that happen. Um, I would actually not mind seeing it happen. Some people think spirea is invasive, right? I think it's fabulous. <laughs> I think it's bye-bye canary grass is what I think when I see spirea invading. Um, um, so, you know, invas invasion is an interesting process. It is in fact an ecological process. Um, it's a good question and it's a legitimate question. Um, and um, it's certainly something to watch. Um, you know, managing for diversity is just fraught with all kinds of pitfalls and challenges. Um, you know, something like, you know, and I mentioned backwards because it is very fast growing and it's wind disseminated. Um, it's only going to be invasive um, in localities that are continuously disturbed. Um, and, you know, it, it has an awful lot of good qualities, just like spirea. Um, it's a fabulous pollinator plant. And one of the neat things about Bacchus is it's actually producing nectar in October and November. It's still blooming right now, which is quite quite unique, uh, you know, in our flora. And so maintaining that span of, um, of pollen and nectar production for the pollinator support is going to be increasingly important. Anyway, I'm sort of sidetracking here. Excellent question. Well, thing to watch. And then um, I guess, George, the question is how, how, how do you feel about how much more you have? Because some folks really want to make sure we get all the way through your presentation before we dive into questions and that we, we see the whole thing before we wrap up. Um, so oh my God. however you want to handle that. How <laughs> much time you got? <laughs> um, I, I, I'm not actually quite sure. I've got a few more slides. Why don't we just pop through a few more slides and then um, I, I, I'm pretty, I could be wrapped up in 10 minutes. How's that? I'm not sure where we are. Oh, 740. We've got oh. about 20 and right. we've got two outstanding questions. So we can wrap up and maybe a few more questions will, will come in as you're finishing up. You bet. Okay, so now we start getting into slightly more um, uh, controversial territory. So here's Umbellularia Californica. And again, so people will say, well, that's a Southern Oregon thing, a Northern California thing. You really wanna bring that up to the Northern Willamette Valley. And to that, I would say, well, it doesn't matter what I want. Somebody else did it you know, 150 years ago. And it's already well entrenched and established and naturalizing all over the place west of the Cascades. Um, just and here's just a, an example of a, a northern California species, um, uh, maybe present in southwestern Oregon. I can't remember, um, but a beautiful ornamental thing um, that would be an excellent candidate. In fact, uh, we're actually experimenting with this here at the farm, Circus occidentalis, western redbud. Um, so. Um, yeah, let's see, I just got a couple more slides here. So uh, Crataegus, um, I just wanted to say a sad farewell to um, our Willamette Valley Black Hawthorn. Um, not to discourage you from trying to plant it and continue to foster it and hang on to it as long as we can. Incredibly important wildlife tree and pollinator supporter. It's just sad to see them die. Um, and I love this old um, alder and I, you know, you think, well, that's a white alder. How come it's dead? <laughs> it died of old age. It, this thing was so huge and so old. Um, there are some record trees of this species in Benton County. They're just absolutely spectacular, beautiful, amazing trees. There's one in Bald Hill Park. You should all take a look at it. It's amazing. It's got, it's about, it's almost four feet in diameter. Uh, it's over, oh gosh, it's gotta be over hundred feet tall. It's a spectacular tree. <laughs> A um, couple of resources to point you to, OregonFlora.org. They've got a new website out. It's fantastic. I highly recommend it. It has great GIS uh, data in it if you're interested in range stuff um, and all, all sorts of other great botanical uh, data. CalFlora is a go-to. Um, I suggest it highly if you're interested in Northern California species particularly. Um, this is the um, uh, website for that preprint that I told you about. If you're interested, um, I'll send a, I'll probably send this uh, presentation to Kristen and Suzanne so they can share it with people if folks Absolutely. are interested. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, that's it. So, 
happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, we've got a few that have come in. Um, there's been one since the beginning, but it's a little um, sort of side topic. You actually talked about pathogens in the beginning. So there was a question about what are you and the nursery industry doing to keep Phytophthora off the landscape in Oregon and not have it look like what happened in California? And then we've got four, four or five other questions too. Phytophthora is a big issue. And it, this gets into the issue of, you know, nurseries in general and what are we doing? Um, and there are big questions and I, fully support um, a real uh, uh, honest reflection on this topic um, and whether, you know, so one of the things that, um, that I've said all along, um, I, I don't know Northern California, right? I don't know Western Washington. I don't know Northern Idaho. I don't grow plants for those regions and I don't send plants to those regions. I always want it to be a local resource. So for folks in the Willamette Valley that need local resources and they need to buy them from somebody that knows plants that's what i want to do i want to help you guys do stuff locally so i'm very much concerned about long distance shipment of, of plants it's one of the reasons we've got phytophthora in the first place phytophthora came to the united states phytophthora and remorum probably came to the united states on nursery stock anyway i don't want to go too far down the pathology uh, thing but i'd be happy to talk more about that it's a serious serious issue um, thanks. Another question. So thinking in the terms of millennia, rainfall climate seems to be shifting to more of a California current as opposed to a Japanese current. Less snow, spurts of rainfall in the winter, drier summer. Should we be planting redwood and madrone and other southern Oregon coast and inland trees and shrubs? Thinking along those lines. Well, that is the question, is it not? Um, <laughs> so the... Um, you know, if you're interested in these sorts of things, you know, the, the, the speculation is endless. Um, there are lots of models out there that talk about um, plant range shifts. Um, uh, there's uh, the Forest Service Seedlot Selection Tool. Um, There's something that I'm sure some of you are familiar with. Um, great modeling folks were, have worked on that from all over the place, particularly down at the PNW lab. Um, um, the answers to that, you know, the modeled answers to that question um, can be found in, you know, in that in tools like the seedlot selection tool. Um, I, <laughs> good question. Um, you know, you look at um, giant sequoia, for instance, and just spectacular performance of that species in the Willamette Valley, unbelievable. Um, actually, I see, um, it used to be that, uh, Coast redwoods planted in the Willamette Valley used to look really lousy. Um, and now they look pretty good. Um, so I think conditions are getting better for redwoods here. Uh, I think that there's all kinds of places in Western Oregon where redwoods are, would be quite well adapted. Keep in mind that that's all about fog. And we don't get a lot of marine fog, real marine fog in the Willamette Valley. Maybe not enough, yeah. not enough to make redwoods happy. And maybe you already answered this question with that resource that you mentioned um, was sort of what um, non-native plants do you see benefiting suffering from climate change? So you talked a little bit about what native plants you see benefiting suffering. Are there, is there you know, the corollary to invasives or non-natives, I guess? It's a very, very exciting and interesting question. Weed ecology is a, is a major interest of mine. In fact, I'm... Um, thinking about putting together a short course on, um, on, uh, on weed ecology. Um, great question. Um, yeah, I think reed canary grass is much less happy than it used to be, to be per perfectly honest with you. Yay. You might find that surprising. But yeah, well, you, you might say that until like, you know, uh, 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 well, what's that giant reed grass start showing up or something else that's like 10 times worse. <laughs> Um, but absolutely, um, if there are native plants that are suffering, then non-native plants are going to suffer too. If they're adapted to this Pacific maritime climate, absolutely, no question about it. Um, great. Um, so a few more rolling in here. After logging, and I'm not sure if this would be a question you'd be able to answer, George, but I'll throw it out. Um, our typical go-to is to dug fir for fiscal incentives, replanting requirements, etc. 
To what extent are there changes afoot to help look at wider fiscal incentives to support more natives after timber harvesting? And I'm not honestly aware of any. Um, that might be a small woodlands or a timber um, type question, but. Well, as far as, uh, well, I, my basic training is as a forester, so I'm happy to have a good forestry question. Um, mm -hmm. I take exception to the Douglas fir forestry of Western Oregon. I think it's, we've, we've short changed ourselves uh, in all kinds of ways uh, with that mindset of, you know, Doug Furs the, is the thing. Uh, that the reason, you know, one reason is um, what about the alder mills? What about the cedar mills? What about the hem fir mills? What about all the products that we used to make out of all, all of these other species? What about all the jobs that are associated with milling something besides just Douglas fir? That's all the same diameter and that's getting milled by computers anyway. So I, I you know, I think that uh, forest management in Western Oregon is an absolute abomination. And I say that as a, as a graduate of the program at PV. Uh, and, you know, one of my objectives in life is to really call PV Hall and all the people um, associated with it and all the aftermath of the 1980s and 1990s of PV Hall. I, I, I fully intend to call them all the task. Absolutely plant anything uh, you want. <laughs> <laughs> besides just Douglas fir. Doug fir is great. Don't get me wrong. I love Douglas fir. It's an amazing tree. You know, the sad thing is going to be though, um, and as, as, um, as our stand research, you know, set, tells us we're losing hemlocks in the, in the uh, uh, North coast range. We're losing Western red cedar. Thousands and thousands of trees are dying right now. That's a valuable timber tree. Stumpage on Western red cedar is through the roof. Like, what are you going to build your backyard fence out of? It's you know, if when we don't have cedars anymore. Um, so I'm not. I want to be sure I try to answer your specific question. Um, we're going to be in a world of hurt in timber in Western Oregon if we can't grow Douglas fir. So one of the things is, you know, is black hawthorn truly a canary in the coal mine? Is grand fir a, a canary in the coal mine? Grand fir, for all the bad press that it gets in in the forestry world, is a spectacular tree. It is in most, across most of the Willamette Valley, historically is our tallest conifer. It's by far our fastest growing conifer and it grows pretty darn good wood. It gets milled along with hemlock. It's a high value, it produces high value products. Sometimes stumpage on Doug Granfer is darn good. Why don't we plant it? You know, why do we set ourselves up for disasters like black stain and other Douglas fir diseases? It's like wall to wall Douglas fir, have we not learned? Have we not learned? Might be another <laughs> ships and science topic for the future. I guess the same person in a different question asked about uh, ponderosa pine. So I don't know if it kind of tied to that. Any thoughts on pea pine? Uh, pine is an interesting thing. Willamette Valley pine is, in my estimation, is actually fac wet. I, I think it's a it's a it's a wetland associated tree. Um, you don't really find uh, ponderosa pine where there's not high water tables in the Willamette Valley. Um, it's an oddball. Ponderosa pine is crazy complex. It's probably one of the, the most complex conifers that there is. Incredibly wide ranging, multiple um, subspecies uh, and, and populations, races, I think they call, uh, some of which are not even, or are, are, are marginally interfertile. So anyway, it's that's a whole another topic, but um, Willamette Valley pine's great. You know, you got to wonder where it's going to go next, because the Willamette Valley is a unique place. You know, we have this combination of climate and soils um, that support that species, the specific race of Willamette Valley pine. Where is it going to go? I don't know. Um, I don't know if it specifically has a place um, in the coast range. Um, if you wanted good coastal material, I would actually look to Lane County. Uh, I think that there's things going on um, in the coast range south of Eugene um, with ponderosa pine that are worth looking at because that's where ponderosa pine jumps up out of the valley floor and occupies um, the hillsides. It's a very different thing down there. So um, again, it's a big topic. Kind of leads into another question sitting out there. Um, can we expect coast range flora to be more resilient because they have the option of elevation gain? So even in the foothills, um, folks are observing plants like salmonberry, red cedar, and things up in higher elevations off the floor. That's a great, great uh, observation. And of course, that's, I, you know, it's got to be true. 
Um, you know, we have to expect perturbations though, even at higher elevations. So if we're jerking the rug out from underneath stuff in the Willamette Valley floor, we're pulling that rug up there too. It's getting warm at higher elevations. And to the extent that there's elevational differentiation in Douglas fir as a, for instance, and there is, that's been well demonstrated. Um, trees that are adapted to higher elevation um, sites in the coast range and the Cascades are also going to be subject to um, kind of differing, differing um, selective pressures um, under climate change. Um, that's not to say that they won't cope, right? I mean, we've these populations have coped with climate change in the past. Um, but, um, you know, I think you could, could safely say that there will be at least refugia for species in the, in the coast range. So yes, I would agree with that. Okay, just a few more. Um, where can Alnus and Kana, the thin leaf alder be found in Oregon? <clears throat> well, that's a great question. Um, in Eastern Oregon, uh, where it's not uncommon um, in the Blue Mountains and the Wallawas, um, it grows along streams. It's a stream bank alder there. Uh, it's, a, it's a shrubby tree, multi-stem. <clears throat> in the Willamette Valley, it lives in peat swamps. It lives in peat swamps, only in peat swamps. So it was a, it was a denizen of Lake Labish uh, before Lake Labish was drained. Uh, and that's a fascinating plant list if anybody's interested in plants. Um, it, it's still floating around. You can find, and I don't remember who the er, early ex, the plant explorer was that, um, was it Gorman? I don't remember. One of those old botanists uh, was uh, got all worked up about Lake Labish and, and did a lot of documentation floor of that place before the last of it was drained. Does everybody Where know what that? Lake, Lake yeah. Labish? Okay, when you're oh. driving on down I-5 um, from <laughs> between Brooks and uh, Salem, so just north of Salem, as you're, as you're coming into Kaiser going south, you drop down that little escarpment and there's that little flat right there, that's Lake Labish. On both sides, uh, parts of Kaiser huh. are built on Lake Labish. Um, not much of it, but a little bit, shopping malls and stuff. Anyway, it's a huge peat swamp. It was a lake, right? Um, Anyway, uh, we don't have time to talk about beavers and <laughs> wetlands, and but uh, Almas and Kena yeah. is an element of that peat swamp habitat. Uh, and uh, so I found it in three little tiny peat remnants in uh, Clackamas County and Washington County. So in, in the Willamette Valley, it's, I only know of these three little localities. Glad to show you where they're at, uh, or you know, tell you more about them um, another time. But um, they're hard to find here, but they're around. Um, do you think the black hawthorn findings um, could be that you've been seeing could be related to lower water tables or even drain tiles on those fields? Absolutely not. No, I, okay. I'll. Yeah, I can say definitively that. Um, while I can't say that it's climate change, one of the things that's funny about science, I'm like the world's worst scientist. <laughs> like, I get, to, I want to leap to conclusions, but sometimes, you know, it's like if somebody's going to punch you in the face and you blink and you don't actually see their fist hit your face, you can't definitively say that they hit your face, right? Because in science, you can't, there's associations, right? You can say that these things are correlated that your black eye is correlated with somebody's fist coming toward your eye. Um, but you didn't actually observe the, the impact. So you can't say definitively that it happened, right? So scientists are very cautious about like saying these things. Like, oh, yeah. um, I'd rather just come out and say it. <laughs> Climate change. <laughs> um, it's a good question. Um, I mean, certainly, yeah. absolutely, unquestionably, we have had untold almost indescribable impacts to the floor of the Willamette Valley by ditching and tiling streams and wetlands, unquestionably, and trapping out the beaver too. Oh my gosh, absolutely. But, um, you know, black hawthorn has, you know, most of these are, are not that old, you know, they're 50, 100 years, maybe 150 the oldest ones. They've been a lot around since the agricultural development of, um, of the Willamette Valley and they're quite weedy. You know, they pop up along fence lines, fence rows, right? They're, our, they're one of our fence row or hedgerow trees, right? Um, so they, they've been established post, you know, all of that Willamette Valley drainage activity. And they found their spot uh, and they were doing just fine. 
uh, until about 2005, and then they hit the skids. Hmm. Good question, though. Um, so thinking about the fires we've had here in Oregon, is Baccarus pilularis, and that's the coyote brush, is that right? Yes. Yeah. That's it. Okay. Um, is that a fuel that could increase the spread of fire? So many excellent questions tonight. This is fantastic. We've got such a great group that attend these events. <laughs> oh, I'll tell you, that's a great question. And so, so pertinent to right now. And exactly correct. Yes, yes, yes. Do not plant this plant any place that you are concerned about fire. Don't plant it next to your house. Don't plant 20 acres on the on the west on the on the east side of your house. Um, good question and very very important. Uh, we absolutely need to be thinking about about fire resilience and adaptiveness. You know, one of the things, and we should know this, right? When we look at the Northern California flora, there's a very strong correlation between hot, dry habitats and that the plants occupying those hot, dry ha habitats are extraordinarily inflammable. <laughs> Just like they're explosively inflammable, you know? Uh -huh. Like you look at the Ceanothus species that are so common in parts of Northern California, they're just like dripping with oils and waxes. They just want to burn and they want to burn hot. Uh, Ceanothus, Manzanita, Bacchus, um, Chrysolepis. These are just like, they. these things are gonna burn. So excellent, excellent question. And very, very pertinent to, to now. We have got changed our contract with fire. Um, and we gotta be smart, we gotta be smart. Yeah. That's not to say that we don't want to include these plants in the system. They're important, but we got to think about whether we want to live next to it or not. Yes, good question. So we're super close to eight. There's two questions. One's, a, I think, a quickie. So I'm going to go with that one. So I'll apologize to our other question here. But um, do you think English hawthorn is um, struggling as well or potentially going to struggle? Good question. Side by side, the English hawthorn seems to be holding up pretty well. Um, but, um, you know, that's, I think, a topic that, that needs more, more observation. It's a good, good question. And of course, they hybridize. Hawthorns are, mm. are notoriously promiscuous, and they, they all hybridize like crazy. There's probably one species of hawthorn. Hawthorn. <laughs> hawthorn, hawthorn. <laughs> good question. All right. Suzanne, do you, should I ask the last one, or do you want to call oh, yeah. it 8 o'clock? Yeah. Are you okay with one more question, George? Sure, ask away. All right, let's do okay. it. Okay. Um, urban greenscapes tend to be more intensely intensively maintained. So do you think uh, nature scaping in urban landscapes, um, as it becomes more widespread, could help give these arcs to plants across the landscape and preserve their species in, in the ranges where they're retracting or maybe even help them move? I think that that's a resounding yes, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, there was a fun uh, article that I read some years ago now about the fact that if we were to convert all of the, the lawns in the United States uh, to native habitats, they would cover more expanse than all of the national parks. And um, so unquestionably, you know, how we're managing our yards and our, our urban landscapes is absolutely and utterly ridiculous right now. Um, and I would encourage anyone to, you know, if you're interested in birds, I mean, oh my gosh, I mean, you look at these native shrubs, I mean, all you gotta do is plant them and the birds come in flocks and they're just moving through in droves, you know, all throughout the year, whether they're going after insects or fruit or whatever, you know, we can support amazing uh, uh, numbers and diversity of birds and invertebrates in just a small area of native shrubs, you know, and you think about, yeah, wow. I mean, think about the bucket of, bucket of bugs, man. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's what's happening in those native shrubs. So yes, please uh, awesome. encourage uh, nature scaping wherever you possibly can. And caution with the flammable stuff. <laughs> Be cautious with it. And I'm, yeah, we're actually working on developing lists um, uh, specifically about that issue and developing fire resilient landscapes. And, and yeah, I mean, as much oh, as I would love to sell great. you a whole bunch of Ceanothus, you know, you know smart question, smart question. Uh, think about what you're planting and where you're planting it. It's important. Yeah. yeah. Well, 
Well, we are at uh, 802 and um, I know we could keep going on. I know we can make probably five more slips and science presentations um, offshoots from this one. So thank you so much, George, for doing such an excellent job um, presenting all the incredible information and, and interesting stories about all you've experienced and seen across the landscape. I, I'm, I don't know if you're looking at chat, but there's some thank yous in here from folks from, um, from the participants. So, uh, and I wanna remind everyone also participating that this is a recorded session and we, I will share it and it'll be on our website uh, for the future and also to share with others that didn't get a chance to view it tonight. So thank you all for attending. Thank you all for being a part of this. And uh, to that last point about naturescaping and, and uh, what you can do in your homes and gardens and landscapes, we are having, and you should see this on our website very soon, a February uh, virtual workshop on how to select native plants for your yard, how to know where to plant them, uh, different site characteristics, being able to identify different uh, sites in your yard where certain native species will be well adapted. And we're working with our great partners at our soil, local soil and water conservation districts. And if you have a question about native plants and where to get native plants and where to put them, they're a great resource for you to go to. So contact your local soil and water conservation districts with those questions. All right, well, thanks again, everyone. Thanks so much, George, and thanks, Kristen, for handling the Q&A, and uh, we hope to see you all soon on another talk. Thank you, Suzanne. Thanks, Kristen. It's been loads of fun. Thanks, bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye -bye.